So Nicholas, you recently resigned from the Air Force, um, where you were the chief software officer the first time this role has existed. I'm going to want to find out how that actually came about. Before we start, the true story here, why did you leave? So first of all, I'd like to thank the men and women who have served our great country and are serving our great country, uh, fighting for our freedoms. I think it's uh, essential to keep in mind that I was serving them. And that's really the focus of my time in the department to ensure that we are addressing the issues we're facing. We have seen tremendous success in the last three years, but only pockets of success. And while I've been hearing the Pentagon leader say the right things, I've yet to effectively see them walk the, the talk. And so that's been uh, challenging because what you see instead is a lack of urgency, but also uh, a lack of uh, adoption of agile and tremendous waste of taxpayer money, but also uh, U.S. companies that are not willing to partner with the United States. Meanwhile, uh, China is taking off, leading the, the pace by mandating their companies to uh, partner with them. Uh, at some point, I had no choice but to raise the alarm because we're seeing that we're losing this battle. Okay, so this is, this is you raised so many things here that we're gonna have to hit on. You know, for example, the civil military fusion that the Chinese regime uh, mandates basically, right, throughout, throughout its system. Yes. But let, let's, let's go back to what's happening here in the US, okay? Now, it's been said, right, in a headline recently that you believe that the US has already lost the war on AI. So we, I don't believe that we have lost. What I said is that if we don't act now and don't wake up right away and not in five to 10 years from now, unlike some, some of the Pentagon reports are saying, but if we don't take a stand now and take action, we have no fighting chance in succeeding uh, 10 to 15 years from now because um, with AI, the velocity of adoption of AI compounds over time. And so effectively, you're gonna be at a situation at some point where you pass the point of no return. You will not be able to catch up. So um, when we say we have 10 years, or when we say in 10 years, China is gonna be leading, first of all, it's wrong because China is leading right now. They're already leading in many of those fields because of the adoption uh, of the technology from their companies. Uh, that's the difference when you compare with the U.S. side, where really at the end of the day, uh, the U.S. companies are leading against China, but we do not have access to that technology. So that puts us behind because effectively we're left uh, not being able to partner and competing at the same time with a massive country with 1.5 billion people that are not waiting for us to wake up. Well, a country that also likes to steal a lot of technology, especially, you know, technology which can be found online in some way in the cloud. Uh, you know, there's, there's constant reports of Chinese regime hacking efforts, very successful efforts. We know, for example, that parts of the you know next generation fighter plane were obtained uh, by by China. There's many many examples of this. Let's start here. AI. What is AI, and how does it play into the Department of Defense and the military, and why is it important, and why is this particular issue so paramount? So. Artificial intelligence is going to be what is going to make or break us in the next years to come. Uh, because effectively what AI can do is uh, making decisions for you, accelerating the access to information, coming to conclusions that the human brain cannot even comprehend. It can also uh, drastically automate access to data and, and tracking data and, and, and be used to, for example, uh, track satellite imagery so we can detect objects and what's going on, which can potentially prevent loss of lives. We've seen it recently in Afghanistan, potentially with better AI, we could have recognized that inside this car was seven kids and, and you could have known that proactively through automation. So, so effectively, it enables us to do much more uh, by adopting artificial intelligence at scale across industries. And you see it across, uh, around us everywhere from text to speech when you can speak to your phone like Siri or, or Amazon and, and tell Alexa, you know, wh what you want to uh, what you want to eat for dinner and it's going to propose different locations. Right. All the, these technologies are driven 
and based on AI. And without AI, they could not exist. And so AI allows us to make decisions faster, but it's a lot more than that, isn't it? Yes. You can also take an example where recently we have uh, a challenge with DARPA, uh, which is the, the Defense Research Lab, where uh, we demonstrated that we could um, uh, have a dogfight, right? So two jet fighters fighting together and have one of the jets uh, completely flown by AI and the other by the best Air Force pilot and every single time the, the human lost. Um, and, and that's, I would argue, is not even the most advanced AI capability that there is on the planet. So it's gonna change drastically the way we think, we do business, the way we even build weapons, because effectively if you know that um, those jet fighters will not be able to compete, what's the point in even investing more into the fifth generation fighters or sixth generation fighter when you have to drastically rethink the way you're gonna design them, man them, train people to use them, and what really the, the, the end goal of these capabilities, particularly also when you start combining cybersecurity to it with cyber offense, where you can take an entire grid system or an entire system down without even leaving your, your living room. You're saying you had a fully automated AI driven, driven jet fighter beat the equivalent jet fighter manned by a human being every single time, every single test. That's correct. Um, yeah, that for a lot of us, I think that's still the realm of science fiction, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's not. Why are you so sure that the Chinese Communist Party is ahead of the U.S. right now in terms of AI development? So I can t tell you we could change this by ensuring that the U.S. companies partner more with the Department of Defense, but by not being able to do that, effectively what we guarantee is that you know these chinese companies have no choice but to work with the ccp and effectively what you end up having is a situation where they get so much data first you you're facing 1.5 billion people so by definition already based on numbers you're already all losing right because they have more data and AI is, an, is, is a data game, right? The more data, the more access to data, the more you can uh, leverage rapid prototyping and rapid delivery of capabilities, right? And that's the other piece with uh, the cycle, right? AI learns upon itself. So the more you can deploy it rapidly, the more you can learn, the more it's gonna be able to uh, accelerate its learning and that's why time compounds and is exponential. And at some point you look back and you just have no ability to catch up. You're basically saying that the amount of available data to the system that's doing the learning is actually incredibly important to the speed at which it learns and uh, basically to its effectiveness. Yeah, and you see it with a US example like Tesla, right? The, the fleet that we have with these cars on the street is how the system gets better uh, weeks after weeks. And being able to send over the air update every two weeks allows Tesla to accelerate its learning, get better at it, and try new features, try new, a better algorithm, see what works, see what doesn't work, uh, try with a subset of the fleet, try with 5% of the fleet, a new version, 5% with another version, see which one sticks. So the more um, uh, end users and the more data you get, the better the system becomes, and so it's exponential. So, and why for these military application AIs, right, is the number of people available or the number of people's data available so important? Because effectively, um, to improve accuracy of the AI model, it's all about volume of data. So the more data you have, the more accurate and precise and effective this AI capability will be in making decisions, in detecting objects, in recognizing my French accent when I talk to Alexa. Right? All these things is effectively driven through that automation. And so, um, you know, despite the fact that the United States is spending more money than many other nations combined in defense, what we, we fail to recognize is that, I would argue when you compare what it costs to do the same capability on the commercial side, and I spent 20 years on the commercial side before joining the Department of Defense, and I, when I was estimating work, I would have to multiply by 10 the cost in DOD uh, because often that's just the way it costs to do business in the department. So effectively, when you spend a dollar, you get 10 cents of value, right? 
that you would get on the commercial side. So we're saying we're spending more money, but are we spending it wisely, effectively? Are we agile enough? Is our acquisition process broken? If we don't adopt agile methodologies that are 22 years old, I started at 15, 22 years ago, and I was implementing agile at the time. And the US government has no agile training to this day mandated for our acquisition workforce. Well, and this is very interesting. So tell us, explain to us what agile means for the layperson.